Hangout is live. Hi guys, it is Christy and welcome to a Hangout that was initially sort of inspired by a really badly done video by a Harvard skeptic on postmodernism. Oh, I'm on your and, notification squad, Christy. All right. Um, Sorry. So, yeah. Um, Right. So what was my flow? I lost my flow now. Right. So yes, we had this discussion with uh, some people about um, the concept and there are people who have a lot more knowledge on this topic than I do as a social scientist who specialized in quantitative methods. I did a lot with statistics, um, but postmodernism definitely falls more on the philosophy side of the humanities. And so we're going to have a discussion with somebody who knows more than me and has actually done a, quite a lot of preparation for this hangout. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to be hearing. Um, um, and I'm also joined not only by Alex, who's going to start us off, but also by the American Anarchist. So, uh, yeah, um, Alex, do you want to start with, basically start at the beginning and let us know how you go. Certainly. Um, so just full disclosure, uh, I procrastinated when it came to taking notes for this. I was like, yeah, I'll go ahead and make notes for this because uh, there, there are things that I'm aware of. But uh, I didn't start until about like three hours ago and then I just nonstop typed. So <laughs> this is going to be a bit of a mess. It's not edited, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot. The thing that I'm most interested in when it comes to postmodernism, aside from the fact that most people don't really understand what it is, which is actually entirely understandable, and I'll get into that in a second, is the uh, history of it. Because most people start in around the 1960s, 1970s, because around 19, I think it was 1979, uh, was when it was first coined as a word, and it was first explained what it actually is supposed to refer to. Um, but precursors to postmodernist thought have been going on since the late 1700s. Um, it, so, majoritively, uh, as far as philosophers are concerned, as far as ac academia is concerned, postmodernism is not something that is definable discreetly. That is considered a bit of a truism among philosophers. It's just simply a methodology, as was um, somewhat formulated later on by other postmodernist uh, thinkers. And something else to bear in mind is that most postmodernist thinkers don't actually call themselves postmodernists because it's not a philosophy, it's a methodology. As I just said, I'm repeating myself. Yay, that's a great start. So, well, we, can, we should probably start off with uh, Immanuel Kant. Um, so back in, I think it was 1779, uh, Kant came up with this concept of the Copernican Revolution. Uh, this was an assumption that we cannot know things in and of themselves um, and that objects of knowledge have to conform to our faculties of representation. So things like God, freedom, uh, immortality, the world at large, first beginning, final end, these are concepts which have what is known as regulative function, which is the idea that we, we know what they're supposed to be. We know the words that are meant to represent what those things are, but we cannot experience these things, or we, at least we cannot know that we are experiencing these things. And as such, it's not something that we can say that we have actual firsthand knowledge of. That would be, let's say, just compared to like the concept of a chair which you can sit in and you can agree on sort of what a chair is. But when it comes to freedom, that's a much more um, amorphous, abstract concept. We can agree sort of broadly on the definitions, but you can't directly experience freedom as a concept the way you could chair. Correct. That's sort of what that's you're a, talking that's about? That's basically exactly right, I'm, yes. I'm playing the, the curious student here, asking expansion questions and clarification questions. So if I interrupt, That's it's good. usually to do that. Yeah, <laughs> that is a good thing. <laughs> um, so uh, that's basically the major con contribution that Kant has made unintentionally towards postmodernism. This is not it, postmodernism itself was not something that people were trying to go towards. This is just something that eventually naturally came about as a result of a lot of different uh, uh, pre postmodernist thought. Um, this uh, this this Copernican revolution was sort of expanded upon by Hegel uh, about uh, I'd say about forty years later uh, in 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 his dialectics uh, specifically in the in the book Phenomenology of Spirit he used the word sense certainty uh, which he described as our immediate ability to experience things and that um, 
our immediate ability to experience things is extremely limited. At least that's what he, what he was explaining and what he was postulating. Um, we, we cannot be certain of our, uh, of, of things in general, because we ourselves via our senses don't have the ability to simply quote unquote experience things immediately as they happen. We have a delay in our minds. Our minds necessarily filter what it is that we are experiencing. So the idea that we are objectively experiencing any one event is a little misleading. At right, least. So would this be like sort of a naive empiricism that you say, oh, I see the world exactly as it exists and my perception of it is 100% accurate. Whereas as we're going to see with postmodernism, we have concepts that we need to understand the world and other ways of experiencing it, not just a direct unfiltered experience. That There are things that mediate the world as it is, as you say, to, to quote Kant, and then how our brains perceive that and understand it as sensory information. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. That is that is 100% on, <laughs> on, on, on the nose. Um, so, you know, Heigl at the time, he was, when he made his dialectics, that was him attempting, well, partially, that was him attempting to define a fully realized concept of what an experience is so that we can actually come up with the idea of how it is that we experience things. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of responses to him. A lot of people think that uh, um, he didn't take into account a variety of different things, especially the foundations of his dialectics that need to be explained non-dialectically. Um, so, and I, but I'm not going to get into any of that because that's not entirely relevant. Uh, and it's also a huge other thing. Uh, but um, so from Heigl, we then move on to Kierkegaard uh, around the same time. Um, so Kierkegaard comes up with another concept that starts to influence the growth of postmodernist thought, um, wherein he describes modern society as not being a bunch of individuals who are simply making up a society with their own individual thoughts and feelings, but that modern society is a network of relations where individuals kind of coagulate into this amorphous concept that we call the public. Um, and he postulated that in modern society, because it is so large at that point in comparison to societies hundreds of years past, uh, it's mostly held together by what he identified as the press specifically, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and when the press uh, presents what is happening to the world or to society, uh, that uh, is the only way in which the public can actually be aware of what is happening at large. Um, uh, be that a, uh, be, to be a part of society essentially means that you need to remain in the loop. Uh, and if you don't remain in the loop, if you don't watch, if you don't listen to the press, or at the very least at the time, if that was your only access to outside information and you didn't pay attention to it, you may as well have been a hermit uh, for all that your thought contributed to society. Um, and experience wise and knowledge wise, uh, it was extremely limited to not experience the, the, the press and it would hinder the public as the concept exists uh, to not pay attention to what is happening. So the invention of the press and the, um, the value of the free press became major cornerstones to the growth of society and societal thought in the form of the public, at least to Kierkegaard. Um, so the press just sort of held together society uh, or societal thought uh, as, a, as an artificial medium. Um, now, I don't think he would have possibly ever imagine that we would get to the point that we are right now where we have the internet uh as being a thing that hold that holds society together even at a much larger extent but i think you can probably apply this sort of um method of analysis to many internet communities because you can find that we are somewhat distinct from each other in some ways some people obviously participate in multiple communities, but there are other communities that are so diametrically opposed to other communities that they would be separated from each other. There's a distinction. Um, and so you can sort of uh, identify the either the forums or the YouTube channels that are that are frequented 
or the blogs, whatever it is that these people get their information from, that is what holds that community together, intellectually speaking. So we sort of naturally culminate towards whatever information is being given to the community that we choose to participate in, and we all then become the public in our opinions. That doesn't mean that we become the same, uh, because obviously even at the time, the public was something that had people necessarily disagreeing with each other. Um, just because something was being presented as being a thing that happened at the time does not mean that everybody agreed on the interpretation of how we should take whatever the event was. Um, that's something that Kierkegaard noted as being something that possibly couldn't even be solved. The idea that people are, are just automatically going to see and interpret matter of factual happenings differently from each other. Um, any questions for that? Uh, no, I was going to just make some links to, you know, like say the use of state propaganda in places like North Korea to limit the discourse and the notions of what can be discussed within that society would be an example of that on like a more practical or pernicious level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, the fact that it is such a huge uh, thing that ties people together means that it's extremely influential towards uh, everybody's thought. And so having a, a, a controlled press is an extremely easy way to control the public, as it were. Um, and again, this is something that was come up at, back in 1846, something along those lines. So this is before 1984. This is before uh, any of the Orwellian things that, that we that we know of now that commented on this. Um, so it was a pretty it was a pretty good hypothesis at the time that has definitely stood the test of time. Um, mm -hmm. Where did I put my notes? Oh no. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so next up on the sort of progress towards postmodernism is Karl Marx. Uh, yes, Marx was involved somewhat in the progression towards postmodernism, oh, but he was no. only one contributor. Not evil Marx. <laughs> Not evil, but evil Marx, no. But he was only one contributor, and his contributions were kind of minor in comparison to others. Um, but uh, Marx's sort of contribution is when he pointed out that society seems to fetishize commodities, and that the value of said commodities seem to fluctuate independent of what he referred to as its corporeal being, um, or, its, or its actual value, as stated by his labor theory of value. And he said, so when workers begin to realize that commodities are just a product of their labor, paradoxically through realizing their place in society and who they are they then lose who they are and sort of de-res from society which eventually automatic which eventually will result in workers becoming displaced and not being satisfied with their lives and eventually uniting as the proletariat and all that stuff but that's another conversation entirely um <clears throat> so <clears throat> Then from there, we get to Nietzsche, who Nietzsche! is Nietzsche. <laughs> it's always my favorite part is Nietzsche. He is probably, he is arguably the biggest contrib contributor towards postmodernist thought, um, which is kind of funny because many of the people who out of hand dismiss postmodernism in general tend to be pretty big fans of Nietzsche. <laughs> so it's a little weird. Um, uh, Nietzsche regularly in his writings would talk about a, a, a disillusion of the distinction between the real world and the apparent world. Uh, he would go back to Plato's writings. Uh, Plato and Platonism would establish that apparent, that apparent truths and things in which we perceive as being real are irrelevant and just throw those away. And what Plato attempted to do was establish that there is one objective quote-unquote true world and that is the only thing that held any sort of truth um irrespective of our of our perspectives uh and Nietzsche's kind of re regarded this true world quote-unquote as simply being another way of saying real world so he felt that the establishment of a true world that's supposed to subsume the apparent world is kind of superfluous um so in that sense, he rejected the true world as being superfluous. So that got rid of our the real world, quote unquote, 
in his words. And since it already got rid of the quote unquote apparent world, now we don't have either. So his idea was that what the truth of the world is, is somewhere in between the two. And many many would postulate that what that would mean is perhaps some sort of virtual world that we all habitate, cohabitate in. Um, and, you know, postmodern thought has sort of drilled that down into making, into, into making the concept that reality is just necessarily a quote unquote filtered perspective for any one individual, no matter what. Uh, we're all participating in the world, but we aren't necessarily what make up the world uh, in a, in a sort of simplified sense, I guess. Um, before I move on, anything there? Nope. Please continue. Unless anyone okay. else has any questions that they want on Nietzsche before Alex continues. Okay. <laughs> All right. Keep going. All right. Uh, so moving on to another thing that Nietzsche, uh, participated in, he was also responsible very much for the current postmodernist art and aesthetics movement. Um, in his very first book, The Birth of Tragedy, he drew parallels to Greek tragedy uh, and the current, at the time, um, sort of synthesis of logic, reason, science, modernism, as it were. And when he analyzed Greek tragedy, he put together that there were two main forces that made it appealing as well as made it capable of growing and advancing. And the two main forces were represented by the gods Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo sort of represented the natural beauty of things which are the way they are. Um, and uh, definitely stressed the virtue of knowing what is. Um, Whereas Dionysus was the essence of frenzy and intoxication, as he put it, uh, wherein we can take what is and we can create fiction from it, or we can create something even grander artificially. It's not necessarily what is, and we're taking a beauty and we're turning it into something else, but he felt that that was very much necessary in order for growth to occur. And at the time, Nietzsche looked at science and logic in the way in which it was currently being done. And he saw it as frozen and lifeless. Uh, and he felt that, that, that it was frozen and lifeless because it was purely Apollonian in, its, in the way in which it works. That, Dion, that Dionysian frenzy or intoxication was divorced from it entirely. Um, and uh, the, the this in order in bleh, he hypothesized anyway that in order to save society from becoming stale, lifeless, and nihilistic, as he put it, he proposed that we need to go back and find that Dionysian frenzy and inject it into our interpretation of reality alongside the Apollonian. Um, in a similar sense, if I want to simplify this a little bit, ContraPoints actually made a similar point uh, not too terribly long ago when uh, she discussed that. There's, there is this valid idea that many of the people who focus purely on the quote unquote academic lack a sort of quote, quote unquote fun or cool factor that uh, appeals to society, a necessary appeal. If you actually want to have the intersubjective experience of quote unquote the public swing the pendulum to your side, um, you need to be appealing uh, in the current way in which thoughts tend to transmit if you want society to accept what you're doing. Um, now, and this is a side note for me, I think the Nietzsche was a little bit uh, too cynical about the attraction that people have to the Dionysian side of things. He saw this whole progression that we were having in logic and science toward, to being this just uh, deadened society that uh, that could not derive any morals from merely what is, that that uh, didn't have any direction other than to just keep going forward technologically and that this was not going to be sufficient for anybody's existential uh, needs. Um, but I think he really underestimated how naturally driven human beings are towards not 
necessarily knowledge, but the fulfillment of our existential needs, um, which I believe is what he was referring to with that, with his Dionysian frenzy and intoxication. Um, we see that uh, very much today. Uh, and again, this mainly can, goes towards YouTube communities, wherein knowledge is kind of secondary. Being able to entertain is the main thing that's going to get you attention and an audience and people listening to you. The knowledge part is not necessary, <laughs> as I think many people would probably agree, <laughs> at least as yeah. far as the way things yeah. work right now. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that's kind of just my thing is that I think that he was very uh, he underestimated our sort of need for entertainment value over knowledge, um, though I don't know too well what was going on at the time that made him think that we were just going to sink into this cold, lifeless logic and science only universe. Um, though I guess that is what some people claim to want these days. I, <laughs> though I don't think anybody actually does. Well, um, we get back to the public and uh, the communications you consume, but yes, moving on. Cause uh, we're going to, yes. Go yes. ahead. Um, do, 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 do. So in his book on truth and lies in a non-moral sense, uh, we then get to this, um, we, we get to his work that says that he, that, uh, okay, <laughs> let me rephrase. In that book, uh, it's a work of his that gives us his perspective on the necessary limits as he saw it, of science and scientific investigation and the establishment of fact and theory, uh, wherein he characterized science and the way in which it establishes these things as being a long series of metaphors that harden into truth over time. Now, I don't know how to necessarily explain this in layman's terms, but I'm going to use a quote um that because because the quote itself is something i can't really break down too fundamentally um but the quote is on this account metaphor begins when a nerve stimulus is copied as an image which is then imitated in sound giving rise when repeated to the word which becomes a concept when the word is used to designate multiple instances of singular events that's the quote um, now, from this, he drew that when we have a conceptual image that's given to us through science, it necessarily equates more than two different things as being the same thing, and are thus, to some extent, not actually true. Um, this feeds into the sort of postmodern analysis method that says that um, because there are multiple ways to approach uh, the question of what is true, you will come away with different answers. And science seeks to come up with one singular one that could apply to multiple perspectives. But in doing so, it comes up with one that explains multiple things at once. And if, they, if, if science is saying that multiple things at once are actually the same thing, even though they're different things, then to some extent, it must be false. Um, that's anyway what he said. Uh, <laughs> if you guys want a better explanation, uh, you can go read on truth and lies in a non-moral sense yourself. Though I will say Nietzsche is notoriously difficult to understand because he wrote that way intentionally because he didn't care if people understood him. <laughs> He's a very odd man. <laughs> I think if people maybe go back and listen to that two or three times, yeah, <laughs> they might get it. Because I followed along just, uh, but I don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that's that's another contribution that he made. Here's another one. Uh, in The Gay Science and Thus Spoke Th Zarathustra, we get an idea of what postmodernists interpret as this result of the loss of distinction of the real and apparent worlds, as I mentioned before, i.e. that uh, the endless repetition of events historically are based on non-historic events. The past does not actually repeat itself, per se, more that, quote-unquote, new events happen and other events happen that are similar but also excuse me but also quote unquote new repetition then of the past is a matter of 
difference instead of identity. Um, on the usage and on the uses and disadvantages of history for life, um, another book that he wrote, Nietzsche proposes that the repetition of the past is an inevitability. That society and in, and the individual are both um, ext extantly contingent upon the repetition of these quote unquote different events. The idea here is that human nature is finite and that what we tend towards is always going to be the same. We all want basically the same thing throughout time. The problem is we require a development of thought, of technology, of the ability to reach these things. And it's a trial and error thing as to how we're going to get to this utopic society that we all want, um, which can lead to very terrible things. But that this is all just new ways that we've, that we've figured out how to screw up. And eventually we'll get to that point where we've actually figured out what we need to figure out. Um, that's, that's one interpretation of what he was saying that postmodernists tend to go with. Um, but like I said, he's extremely difficult to understand. So that might not necessarily be what he said. That's just what postmodernists take away from it. Um, I think that's the end of the Nietzsche part of it. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Anyone want to jump in? How, so what do you, just give us a preview. What do you still have to cover, just so we have a sense for time? Not too terribly much. Uh, Martin Heidegger uh, and a bit, uh, like a slight bit of Derrida. And then we get to the actual culmination of the coining of the phrase postmodernism. Okay, yeah, but no Wittgenstein or anything. Okay, we're not going that way. All right, cool. Then, yeah, I, I think nobody's jumped in. So I, maybe we'll just keep going. We'll pile through and get to the end of it, and then I'll throw it. I think I'll uh, throw it over next to Gwen because Gwen did a great video on this and would really love to hear uh, some responses. So, yeah, uh, let's, let's go through. Keep going. Okay, so Martin Heidegger uh, was very much influenced by Nietzsche's work and, very, and, and mediated on it, meditated on it, uh, thought about it a lot, and regularly would ruminate on his work. Uh, he even referred to Nietzsche as the death of Western metaphysics. Um, as he claimed, Western metaphysics, according to Heidegger, was essentially uh, this inevitable trending towards the development of technology so that we can be in the presence of what is called realized beings, uh, given Nietzsche's work. And uh, the realized being is just a person who has come to fully understand who they themselves are in the place of the universe, and that we all wish to be a part of other people who are that essentially. Now, Heidegger bemoans that we're all trending towards a metaphysic where people are no longer actually people, and that science is no longer science, and that all of this is just merely an ends into, uh, in and of themselves to establish being, in establishing being as being a part of society, as opposed to, and, and being in other people's presence. Being, and fully realizing it to Heidegger, is not the emergence from being anymore but the emerging and passing passing away of beings within and among other beings uh this sort of uh fear that we're tending towards an ultimate collectivism as opposed to fully realizing individualistic tendencies um so postmodernists do tend to accept Heidegger's reflection on being and what realization and derealization are uh, of beings through the enframing of the growth of technology. But outside of that, most of the other things that he says about Nietzsche, they just go entirely in the opposite direction with. Um, like when Heidegger says that Nietzsche is the death of metaphysics, Derrida commented that all Heidegger was essentially doing, and it was kind of a bit of a philosophy joke uh, coupled in with a criticism was he was uh, simply committing a repetition event of a diff of the different and the new, trying to gather thought into its quote proper essence and vocation, and thus uh, this would be repeated differently in new ways in the future. So no actual quote unquote death of metaphysics was act was going to be occurring, um, despite Heidegger's uh, fears. All of this eventually culminated into what we now know as postmodernism. 
uh, as was coined by Jean-Francois Lyotard. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. I might be butchering it. Uh, <laughs> to me, and I took French, so. Um, and he came up, he, he, made the, he wrote the book, uh, The Postmodern Condition, a report on knowledge. This was less of a philosophical essay that was meant to create a new method of analysis and more an attempt to create an objective report on postmodern thought and how it works, um, as well as experimenting with uh, Wittgenstein's creation uh, known as language games. Uh, the idea that different modes of thought express different modes of language uh, and that these different language games can be identified and that depending on the language game you're playing, you're able to do some things but not other things in philosophy. Um, it, so, do it all. Uh, basically, Lyotard de, uh, defined postmodernism as, quote, the incredulity towards meta-narratives, which, as a result of its criticism of science, meant that science cannot legitimize other concepts which don't specifically use the denotation language game because science uses because according to the book science uses the denotation language game exclusively to all other types of language games. Because it does that, it can it, 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 it can't create a it can't legitimize other things that don't use denotation, such as as he put it, moral prescription. Um, and since then, there's been a wide debate on the concepts of postmodernism. Plenty of philosophers have contributed to it since then. Uh, Derrida, Foucault, uh, Leotard himself has been a major contributor. Um, especially as the coiner of the phrase. And there has been a lot of, of people who have responded to it, though the problem is that most people who respond to it don't actually take it seriously at all, um, which is definitely not helping. Um, when you have people like Noam Chomsky who say, I don't understand what, what they're saying. I think they're just making it all up. It seems nonsensical to me, and I don't believe in it. Um, that's a very strange response to anyone philosophy to say, I don't understand it, so it's nonsense. I don't, <laughs> that doesn't really make any sense. And it's very surprising to hear it from someone like him. Um, but uh, at, there has been uh, valid critiques. Uh, I think Habermas is the main one that people go to. Uh, the he wrote The Philosophical Discourse of Modernity, uh, where he criticized uh, Nietzsche, he criticized Derrida, he, he criticized Heidegger, he criticized Foucault. He's like, I'm taking you all on, <laughs> and I'm going to criticize all of your beliefs. And there has been responses to him, because he actually took them seriously, um, which most people, including basically everyone on YouTube, don't actually do. <laughs> Right. That was really, really thorough, and you explained things very clearly, so I just want to thank you for that. Now, maybe as we go on in the discussion, we'll talk a little bit about what postmodernism was sort of taking on and challenging in terms of meta narratives, in terms of what that means about a grand narrative and singular, I think the idea of a singular explanation and stuff. So yeah, I was going to hand it over. I see Gwen nodding, so why don't I, I just give you the mic? Go ahead. Oh, all right. Now we've got you. Sorry, you were muted. Okay, can you hear me? Am I good? I hear you now. Okay, good. Um, so that was the thing, actually, that I found very funny, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's sort of ironic, but the day that I uploaded my initial video about Armored Skeptic, I went to his channel, and uh, just by coincidence, I saw that he had just uploaded a video, and it was his postmodernism video. So I thought to myself, I've just gone through a year's worth of Skeptic's content, and he just made a video about postmodernism. I have to do a video response to this. And I got, I want to say halfway through it, before he, he made some sort of comment uh, about like the, the history of, of modernism that postmodernism was responding to. He, he talks about like uh, the Enlightenment era and stuff like that. And I just remembered, I kind of flashed back to this thing that I remember uh, hearing Greg say that um, he doesn't like ideologies. That's something that he said a couple times. Um, and postmodernism uh, is like a weird parallel to that. If you think about it, it's kind of a, a rejection of of that of that meta narrative. 
it's a rejection of, of the theory that's the rejection of theories. Um, so f for someone um, in Greg's position to have that concept of postmodernism as being this, this very scary thing, and he doesn't like ideologies, so he's going to shy away from it. There was, there was kind of a simple irony to that that I enjoyed and that sort of compelled me to do a response to Greg. But my response was uh, very much situated in the material that I had studied. When I was an undergrad, I studied English and I had a minor in philosophy. So a lot of the stuff that I was looking at was having to do with narrative, but very much in a in a the sense of literature and looking at um, fiction and nonfiction. And I remember taking a class on a lot of postmodern literature. And uh, I mean, we looked at like um, Don DeLillo and uh, Mary Caponegro and David Foster Wallace and uh, other such names, other such authors. And I just remember sitting through Greg's video and just thinking, I have no idea um, what he means, which... Can you, uh, can you explain yeah. a little bit about postmodern literature and what it is that sort of characterizes it and sets it apart from the literature that it's that came before it? Um, can you, just for people like me... Oh, yeah, yeah, courses. absolutely. Well, um, I think in a word, it would be irony. It's, it's very much... Um, and that's, I guess that's the, also kind of the, the characteristic that gives it its strength and also its weakness. Irony kind of promotes um, a commentary that's inherent to the literature. So if you talk about some given subject, you want to address some given social idea, some, some social context, you're going to maybe if, address it ironically and that's going to come off as very ins insincere but that's a way to construct a narrative of maybe a fiction narrative that inherently gives the commentary that you want to give. Um, so I, I remember one example is um, the, there's this short story by Mary Caponegro where she is talking about, I think it's, it's like these kids and uh, they are like running their own abortion clinic and it's a very, very absurd story, but it's actually, it's obviously, it's a politically, it's a very loaded story. So it's got a lot of social commentary in it, but there's this kind of, of funny sense that you always get when you're reading it, like you're constantly stepping back and just thinking to yourself, this is, this is nutty, this is absurd. Um, and that's very much what it's like to read David Foster Wallace. I remember reading uh, his book, Brief interviews with hideous men, which was actually made into a movie. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but um, I think it's got Ben Gibbard in it, the lead singer for Death Cab for Cutie. Anyway, uh, it's got a lot of really almost surreal kinds of moments in it, and I think it's it's very difficult for me to explain because I was I was only ever an undergrad, and um, I my experience was often feeling very um, very put off, actually, by a lot of postmodern literature. Not in the sense that I didn't like it, but in the sense that I was worried about the, the kind of things that David Foster Wallace was writing about more towards the end of his life, where he was worried about the lack of sincerity in literature. And that's the sort of thing that I've always liked very much. So it was, it was very weird for me to find myself in a situation where I felt like I was defending postmodern literature um, and the rejection of meta narrative, which is a useful tool, um, but alone can have some complications. And can we talk a little bit more about that concept of meta narrative since you brought it up and uh, Alex touched on it? Would you be willing to expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I suppose there's there's kind of a, a couple ways that people conceptualize it, and the, it, the in the technical sense, the really common way that people think about meta narrative is in the break of it. So like a fourth wall break is a, a kind of very common um, break in a narrative. Like I remember going to see the uh, Deadpool movie with my father and, you know, every time Deadpool turns and he lo looks into the camera and he talks to the audience, you get this break in the fourth wall and he's constantly remarking on the film and that's how those comic books are. Um, and that's how a lot of, of literature like that is. Um, but that's a very simple marker and that's that's a very technical marker. I think in terms of meta narrative at the social level, 
people have shared common ideas that they accept as true and the rejection of that meta narrative is more to understand that those ideas are just ideas that people have um not necessarily inherent truths um that are out in the world um so an, another weird example that i once gave a, a science professor of mine was that um people think of gravity as just this thing that's constantly out there but if you think about the history of the universe and everything um not only do we think of gravity in a very relativistic way things fall to earth actually it's more complicated than that but also there was a point in time in the history of our universe so scientists uh, have told me that gravity did not exist and so as a law it's not um the kind of absolute perfect truth of life the universe and everything that, that i think people might make it out to be and that goes for a lot of uh postmodern conceptualizations of social ideas and of tools within within art and so postmodernists often break the mold of what is considered to be the art it's like um like like a fourth wall break or or, or any other such similar thing all right, I'm interested in your take on this because um, would you say that the um, it, is everyone here mostly familiar with Game of Thrones? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so the Although way that I still Martin... haven't seen the last episode of the last season, so hopefully there's no spoilers to that. No, 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 no. It's more about the way that Martin subverts all the expectations of what the characters are supposed to be—princesses and princes and bastards and things. And um, it occurred to me, sort of reflecting, and that—that's a sort of very postmodern, it would seem, approach to a traditional fairy tale. Um, to take those kinds of things, our expectations of what are meant. Uh, things that are meant to happen to the characters and where they're supposed to end up in their arcs and really mixing it all up and the uncertainty then that that introduces into the experiences of reading or uh, watching. If I don't know who wants to come back on that. I, 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 I would love to actually because fantasy literature is totally my thing. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's kind of a, a two-way street with Martin because on the one hand, if you listen to him talk about Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire, he very much began with that kind of mindset. Like he talked about the White Walkers and the Night's Watch and how if you look at like Lord of the Rings and, and much older high fantasy literature, there's this sense of using white to denote the bad guys and, and black to denote things that are evil. And he wanted to kind of flip that narrative. And in flipping it, he's commenting on it and uh, he's, he's breaking from it. But then um, at a certain point in the narrative of A Song of Ice and Fire, the the story does really want certain characters to succeed certain characters to win certain battles and it becomes very sincere and i think then there's that tension of wanting to break free from the not just the tropes of fantasy but kind of the the expectations that the series itself has created if you're expecting every character to go into the battle and die it's it's sort of like you end up wanting to expect the unexpected and then realizing that you shouldn't which is an interesting emotion to have. <laughs> I can't think of a lot of other shows or pieces of art that have produced those kinds of feelings in me, at least. Um, yeah, which is part of the reason I like it so much. But we're not going to get on a Game of Thrones tangent. Uh, does anyone else um, here want to jump in before I um, try to lead the conversation someplace else? Uh, AA, do you have any thoughts on all the things that have been said so far or any questions? Nope. Anything I could have added has been explained by both Gwen and Alex here much better than I could have. Um, honestly, my basic understanding of postmodernism was essentially, well, the basics of, it's more a, um, what, shit, I'm forgetting the words for it, and there was just a motorcycle outside, I don't know if you heard that. Oh, shit, I yeah, That's why I mute whenever there's background traffic, that's okay. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I was in the middle of docking, so it wasn't like I could just mute and then Come back. Well, I mean, I could have, but yeah. but yeah, basically I knew that it was more of like a methodology than like an actual philosophy. So as opposed to, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of philosophy behind it, but yeah, everything that I could have said has been said by both Gwen and Alex better. They have better understandings than me. I'd also well, recommend that people watch Gwen's video as I did. 
Definitely, definitely. I'll put a link, a card to that in the video when this goes up as a regular video. Uh, the thing I want to throw out now to the experts on the panel <laughs> would be um, this question. Why do people find postmodernism so threatening and what do they get wrong about it? I see Jordan Peterson has quite a lot of videos on this. Obviously, you know, Armored Skeptic did a video on it. So what are the perceptions you have of people's uh, objections and, and what, if anything, you know, in particular, do they get wrong about it? Yeah, I think if it, a lot of it doesn't really have anything to do with postmodernism. It's kind of the strange thing. Uh, the, the, the sort of fear that people have for postmodernism is just, it, postmodernism is in a very interesting position where everyone knows it's not something that's easily definable in any sort of discreet way. And so if people have this idea, this concept in their head that it's at the very least some sort of philosophy, right? Um, or that it's some sort of way of looking at the world, but they don't really know what it is. They know they're not one, or at the very least they think they aren't. Um, so it's very easy for anybody to just point to all the things that they think are wrong with modern thought and just blame it on postmodernism because nobody really has the ability to say, that's not what it is because very few people actually care enough to figure out what it is. So it's, it's less that people fear postmodernism. And in my, from my perspective, uh, at least on the public level, in the academic level, it kind of changes a bit. But on the public level, it's less that people have an actual fear of postmodernism more than they have. They, they have noted that there is a lot of thought going on in, the, in their society that they disagree with. And they want to blame it on some sort of all-encompassing phenomena so they can just sort of say that's not, that's, that's the bad thing. I can say that's the bad thing and I don't have to say anything more i can just identify it in one word and say that's bad and then they can just blame everything on postmodernism they can blame whatever form of feminism they don't like on on postmodernism they can blame um any sort of uh analysis of morality that they think is wrong on postmodernism they can blame uh media they don't like on postmodernism and it's not that simple but it's definitely sold by people who are supposedly thought leaders um, as being this all-encompassing boogeyman philosophy. When it's not even a philosophy, it's a methodology. Um, in academia, though, it's a little bit different because in academia, there's sort of a frustration because postmodernism is sort of the, the annoying guy with a pen poking at the scientist and going, yeah, but you don't really know it's true, do you? And then the scientist is just like, could you leave me alone? I'm trying. It's, it's basically, <laughs> that's basically the fear that, the, it, I wouldn't even say fear, the annoyance that people have with postmodernism. This, the, um, it's, it's them, it's the fact that postmodernists tend to be very contrarian uh towards uh conventional wisdom and conventional thought and uh it's it can it can be very annoying for those who are trying to investigate things um and uh it's also the fact that as i mentioned before most people who are in not just philosophy and science not just philosophy but also science don't actually know what postmodernism is all that well either. So when they read postmodernist literature, I mean, they try, they try to read Derrida, Foucault and stuff. Um, when they try to read it, they don't really understand it. And then they go, well, I don't know how to respond to this. So I'm just going to try to ignore it, but it's not going to go away. So it's just this endless cycle of, I don't know what you're saying. Well, what I'm saying is that you can't be certain. I know I can't be certain, but based on what? I don't, uh, I'm trying to explain to you that science is not perfect. Well, sure, it's not perfect, but what's your point? That, that is my point, that it's not perfect. And then it, they're just not going anywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> So postmodernists yeah. can't really engage with people because the people don't know what the, what the point of the postmodernists are in the first place. Um, so it, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of hectic in the academic scene. Yeah, I guess when I was thinking about that, I see a lot of religious 
lectures on YouTube talking about the dangers of postmodernism, and I think they're linking it to moral relativism and questioning of those kinds of things. But yeah, um, Gwen, on that idea of um, why people find it problematic and w what they get wrong about it, problematic, of course, is a word that sets some people off. But yeah, what are your thoughts on that? And then uh, I say, hey, because uh, we've just been joined here by Ted. So um, I'm going to come to you after Gwen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess, um, and I, I've got I've got something of a pet theory on this. Um, I ha I have a discussion that I keep having with my one friend about um, political literature and why uh, right wingers sell so many books, and why can't I sell as many books as as Ann Coulter? I think I'm smarter than Ann Coulter, or at least I, I say things that are more true than Ann Coulter says. So why can't I sell that many books? And I think there's a lot of reasons, but um, as far as, as this one particular theory that I have about it goes, I think some people really want um, to be told certain things. And sometimes there's, there, there develops a sort of discourse that is somewhat inbred. And with enough fear mongering about postmodernism coming from people who really do just kind of want that scapegoat, that, that easy thing to blame for whatever they see as being wrong with contemporary art or contemporary philosophy or society or what have you, um, there kind of becomes like that really repetitive um, man of postmodernism. And I, I don't, I don't know, I can't actually say whether or not Armored Skeptic has watched Jordan Peterson's videos about postmodernism, but if I had to bet, I would say absolutely probably more than one. You see some echoes of that um, in Armored Skeptic's work then? Yeah, I do. Um, and it's it's in his style. I think Greg has a kind of approach and a way that he vocalizes a lot of his, his thoughts and feelings on postmodernism in his video. But I definitely, I, 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 I will confess, I've never sat fully through a Jordan Peterson video. But the bits that I have seen are... There, there are some things that seem verbatim to be what Greg believes. Right. So, uh, citation needed there. Um, right. Yeah. So, Ted, uh, you're you're kind of coming in in the middle of it, but um, um, if you don't have any like you know uh, answers because you just dropped in, that's fine. But were you more um, interested in like speaking on postmodernism or hearing what people had to say, or did you have a question from what you've been listening to? So, yeah. What's up with you? Uh, um, no. Uh, my own. Yeah, sorry, I'd muted myself to be for background noise, but yeah, we can hear you just fine. Well, uh, I did a bit of background reading in the search through Greg's video, awful as it was. He seems to be just joining in what they're all saying. Like, every idea they don't like, they just call it postmodernism as a scapegoat. And I guess postmodernism is about thinking outside the box, like the lecture you showed us what the guy said okay that's a table but who says it's a table that's what postmodernism is about obviously you can have too much of that kind of abstract thinking, but I don't think people left do that, and I don't think saying, oh, feminism is just postmodernism, just because they don't agree with it, is helpful. 
So we more I know. <laughs> no, no, but I want to pick up on a point that you mentioned about uh, the idea of concepts. And I watched a, a lecture that was given, uh, I think, at the University of uh, in Texas on postmodernism. And one of the points that the uh, the guy was making was about the way that again, this comes back to the sort of modern view of, of things. And I'm pretty sure in Greg's video, he, you know, when we talk about like the modern period and then sort of postmodernism and then like the modern era of the 1950s. And I, I think sometimes he kind of conflates the modern era with modernism. And anyway, um, so yes, this idea that we observe the world you know, came out of empiricism, came out of the Enlightenment. And the idea that this guy was connecting to postmodernism is sort of what, what Alex was saying about Kant and, and Nietzsche and the way that information is processed um, both by our physical bodies and how we perceive things. For, for instance, people who have, um, you know, color blindness, red, green, perceive the world differently from other people, right? It's not wrong if that's a perception of it. But then there's also a level on which our society is organized by concepts. You know, what it means to be an American versus being able to pass the Britishness test and the kind of concepts and values and perspectives that are associated on those things. Um, and recognizing those and stepping back from them a little bit and looking at their influence and and I think that that's probably for me I think that's why religious people find postmodernism so threatening is because it's as you said it's not an ideology it's a methodology it's an approach it's an analytic tool and that leads to questions and questions can be dangerous when you need to take things on faith so definitely angry. Uh, I know some religious people that under their lens homosexuality is wrong. It's a sin that it's amoral. I, I have in my moral beliefs and the way I'm centered, I can't obviously think like that at all, but they obviously can't think like I think. So it's all about having like your own different lens, if right. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that was a particularly loaded example, I know, but well, fitted. Yeah, that was, no, 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 I appreciate your thoughts on this as always. Uh, I see American Anarchist has something to say on this, so uh, we've gone in turns now. Yeah, you want to unmute yourself? Yes, um, attempting to avoid being redundant, I'd like to bring up that, um, well, like um, Ted said, the um, postmodernism is kind of like this scapegoat that people go to, kind of like how the Nazis would go, oh, is there something wrong in your life? It's clearly the Jews. The Jews are the problem. They own all the banks and everything, despite how true or untrue it is. They could point at something and say, hey, since you don't know that, uh, or since you don't understand the nuance of the situation i can point at jewish people and i can create a contempt for it and tell you that this is the problem it's ultimately the same thing with postmodernism of course it's not going to lead to like some kind of genocide of a people but the way it's scapegoated because people have a hard time explaining it as alex said because really what it is, is the purpose is, um, honestly, I really like the way that Alex put this, um, where he said that postmodernism is kind of that guy poking the scientist with the pen saying, well, you're not certain. You can't be for sure. You can't know this for sure, can you? It, I mean, it is kind of like that. Um, I, it, that is a bit of a simplification. I will, I will admit. Well, I have to go for a few minutes does. to help get groceries up. Yep. Okay. Yeah, do I you want to continue? Yeah, Alex? Yeah, it is a bit of a simple, uh, uh, an oversimplification is, is that that's what they do. Because there is a lot of complex thought when it comes to uh, postmodernism. I, I, I just went through um, 
uh, a, a very large history of it <laughs> for the first half hour of this. Um, and a lot of it is, is it basically boils down to uh, a questioning of our capabilities to come up with a coherent uh, epistemology that actually represents truth in a, ver in, in a way in which everybody can understand. Um, and the, the questioning of that uh, is something that I think is inherent to a lot more people than they would like to admit. Um, as Gwen noted before, uh, in Armored Skeptic's video on postmodernism, he was being very postmodernist in the way in which he approached the subject. Um, and he's very postmodernist in the way he approaches a, a great many subjects. The only ones that he doesn't approach in that way, to my knowledge, is purely scientific subjects, which uh, he already agrees with, like, for instance, climate change or the idea of the world is round and not flat. Um, or evolution, or just simple things like that. Things that conventionally most people seem to understand is at least to the degree in which we can establish something, it seems to be true. Um, and all postmodernism is doing is saying, look, science may say all of these things, and we may accept all of these things, and we may be valid for accepting these things. Um, but ultimately, we have to ask the question if science is so easy is so well I, I shouldn't say easy but if science is so objective and science is capable of giving us all this knowledge there is a problem that we have in the idea that there are people who exist today who believe the earth is flat who are of sound mind and body why is it they think that I, that's, that's something that postmodernism is very interested in trying to figure out the question to the, the answer towards, uh, the idea that there are people today who far more likely will cling to a fundamentalist and literalist modern creation of uh, literalism in, in the Bible, as opposed to accepting, uh, what science says about the age of the earth and, 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 and evolution and natural selection and, and genetic variants and all these things. Um, the fact that there are people who, be who believe in angels uh, still, um, why is it that that happens? If science were so uh, objective and capable of creating so much truth, um, why is it that there are so many people who still exist in society today, who participate in society, who will benefit from the, from science, who just, ultimately reject it in many different ways. Um, and not only that, but there's people who reject science as it, uh, as it comes up with more things, like the idea of the gender spectrum. That's, not, that's now starting to become a lot more mainstream. Well, it's been fairly mainstream for a little while in science. Um, the, the idea that sex isn't even necessarily binary. That's something that, science is, uh, that scientists have been able to uh, come up with uh, research to validate. Um, but these things are rejected by so many people. Why? Well, not really because the science is flawed. It's just because they don't believe it. <laughs> and I, I've always been, and this is, this is a personal thing for me, but I have been of a position for a little while now that the vast majority of people who believe things that are true don't actually believe them because they've analyzed the subject at all. They just so happen to have been lucky enough to be born in a situation where they believe things which are true. That's, that's sort of where I think most people are. Um, and I, I think postmodernism would uh, agree with that, at least to some extent. It might, they might quibble with me saying true, but I think it would definitely say that that was uh, that's not an inaccurate portrayal of the human condition and when it comes to knowledge. Right. I'm going to answer and then kick it over to Gwen because she's up next. While you were talking, my thought was about the fact that because I was trained in the social sciences, in particular political science, one of the things that we look at a lot is voting. There have always been several explanations for why people vote because there are several reasons why people vote. So we don't, <clears throat> sorry, but when we do one of our, um, our, our linear models, you know, we'll put in their, um, their age, you know, whether they identify as a man, woman, we'll put in their education, their social class, we'll put in, you know, other theoretical factors, and we'll come up with a model that, let's say, if we put in party identification, might explain 97% of the variance. That is to say, like, when you have all of these information, you'll only get three cases out of every 100 wrong in terms of predicting how people voted. But that's not any one person. 
you, you can't apply that equation that we use to test and to interpret the coefficients to any one person. Some people are their party identification. That's just how they vote every time. Other people go from party to party depending on, let's say, economic policy. Some people vote based on who they think can win in that constituency and is closer to them in political space. So this idea, I think, really comes in the natural sciences of there being a right answer and a wrong answer, which, of course, being based in mathematics reinforces that dichotomy. And it's very important that science get things right and not wrong when they're making planes and rocket ships and space stations and, and then running nuclear plants. These are important things to be very precise on. But that doesn't mean that everything in the world is going to fall into those categories or into simplistic answers. You know, there's a joke that in physics, if they have a model for something um, and it's a circle, it could be either a cow or a coffee mug because that model actually, like as far as physics goes, sort of pretty well explains it. It explains it enough. It doesn't have to have all the variation. But when you're trying to understand human behavior in societies, you need to take into account a lot of things. Your models have to be a lot more variegated. They have to capture a lot of different in your population. And so it's, it's never been difficult for me to accept that there can be more than one right answer. It depends on what the question is. And anyway, that was, um, it's not really to do with modernism, I, I can't really contribute on a philosophical lens. So at least on a, on a practical lens, I thought I, or um, level, I would throw that in. And then yeah, kick it over to Gwen. I, uh, I would like to respond actually to something that Alex said, because I would go even further with that comment about um, the reasons why people believe certain things and come to certain conclusions. Um, uh, I, I would say even more perhaps than the situations that they're born into, throughout people's lives they, they enter and leave in a, a great number of situations and that certain ideas are marketed towards certain people and certain people are because of the situation they're currently in or things that have happened to them, maybe traumas, are easier, um, so e it's easier to sell them on, uh, on those kinds of ideas that are being marketed towards them. So, um, for example, I remember, uh, and actually, it's funny because uh, Peter Coffin's just making tons of videos that I love recently. He's done one, a few on postmodernism, and he did one about this particular kind of thing as well. Um, I, I forget the term that he used for it. But it's stuff like The Secret, which was that, that book that um, Oprah Winfrey had on her show some number of years ago. Uh, it's, it's like the concept of positive attraction, where if you think good things and feel good things, then good things will happen to you. Um, and of course, as a consequence to that, as a balance to that, if you think bad things, then good things won't happen to you. And then if your situation is bad, then it's because you didn't think enough good things. That kind of thought regardless of whether or not it's true, appeals to people in certain situations. If you're in a situation where you really feel like you need, you need an escape, but you don't have a lot of practical power over your situation, and suddenly something happens, and mysteriously, miraculously, you escape a very bad situation, you'd be tempted into thinking that, you know, if I just maintain whatever mindset I had at that time, I could... Uh, continue to reap good benefits of that good mindset. And I think people have a lot of, a lot of thoughts like that where they create causal relationships where there aren't any. And um, that's, how, that's how they come to a lot of very strange and funny conclusions in their lives. I think there are certainly, and studies from psychology have shown that people, some people prefer certainty and some people are better at tolerance of ambiguity. And I think my talents for ambiguity in moral situations or in life or in complex, you know, things is, is quite high. But again, um, you know, you find people who are more conservative, people who have a clear senses of right and wrong, they're attracted to, you know, law enforcement and other very necessary parts of society. So you could look at it from an evolutionary point, you need both the people who tolerate ambiguity and the people who see right and wrong because you have to balance each other out a little bit. That's again, not to do with postmodernism. I'm just trying to be relevant. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think uh, Ted, if you have anything, of course, you know, if anyone you can ask a question or do a pass, but if you have any thoughts, um, yeah, I'm gonna kick it over to you now. Were you kicking it over to me? Oh, man. No. Oh, Ted. 
So, Sorry, I'm like missing some things because I'm trying to get my bearings a bit. Yeah, sorry, I'm like, I'm really springing it on people. I'm being a very bad uh, hangout hostess. But anyway, I'll be quiet now so Ted can speak. Oh, well, I was just thinking, like, my political beliefs, they're very strong. In some ways, I can't imagine how they could be different. But I'm sure if my parents were big conservatives, I would probably, well, if not be a conservative, be slightly more sympathetic to conservative ideology. So nothing is like black and white in that sense. Yeah. So, yeah, there are. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. The trouble talking about postmodernism because nothing, it's about nothing being clear cut. So, by nature, it's hard to make a definitive point about something indefinitive. Right. I mean, it's something that's, it's, you're describing the process of, or the result of, or something that has the characteristics of postmodernism, but you're not really pointing at, you know, like we think about ide ideologies, they're a coherent set of ideas that stick together and they frame the world. And postmodernism is a way of unframing <laughs> the world, yeah. as it were. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, I just want to talk, so open up the floor to see if anyone wants to speak about the role of postmodernism and social justice that some people are linking up, because that's an area, again, that I don't know a whole lot about. And if you have thoughts on it, I would appreciate it. So anyone want to take themselves off mute for that? Oh, I see Alex is up. I would say that when it comes to the subject of social justice and postmodernism, while I think people who are into social justice may be more open to postmodernism. Not everybody who's into social justice is necessarily a fan of postmodernism or even knows what it is. A lot of people don't know what it is. But I do think that the um, deconstruct that like the deconstruction of how we frame things can be very useful as it can help provide an understanding and a different perspective of why these things exist and if they even need to exist. Does patriarchy need to exist? Um, why does it exist? If the answer is no, we can get rid of that. Of course, that's not necessarily part of postmodernism. That's just a general statement I'm making. But the deconstructive nature of postmodernism, how we deconstruct how we frame things. Um, I think that is a very useful tool. But, I mean, equating everything social justice to simply being postmodernist, I don't think that that is very accurate on the part of a lot of more right-leaning or centrist YouTubers. Of course, our center is on the right because, well, um, you know, we... What's politically correct, the Overton window is very much shifted to the right. It has been doing that for years. So, you know, our center is in the right, but even but being in the center of the most debated points. Um, so, yeah, the right-leaning and centrist people, um, I don't think that it's necessarily correct on there and to associate everything related to social justice as postmodernist since, well, one, postmodernism is very broad. It's a methodology. It's not a philosophy. It's not necessarily meant to put ideas or it's not necessarily meant to create new social understandings. It can be used for that, but it's a very... It's like I said, it's a methodology, and I feel like I'm repeating myself a bit here. If I'm doing it, just stop me. 
<laughs> well, I was I wanted to pick up on one point, um, which isn't really so much related to postmodernism, but I did want to intervene because it's an opportunity to talk about the Overton window. And I have to say, I've, I've seen this word bantied about on YouTube quite a lot. And I've sat through a lot of academic conferences and a lot of um, academic presentations on voting behavior. And I've never seen this term, the Overton window. And I thought, is this some sort of American thing or is you know in the American literature that I'm not familiar with or just have I missed out on some sort of panel <laughs> like every single conference but then I, I saw an article and I actually want to do a video on this this was an idea Kate who was that was come up oh, sorry the idea of the Overton window was developed by a guy who worked at like a conservative think tank and so um, I wanted to, I actually did a quick search in Google Scholar and I couldn't find any papers that mentioned the Overton window. So I want to do a bit more research about it. Um, but it is interesting to me that this whole concept has been you know, generated and talked about and pan passed around. And yet I don't see any academic work that's actually using it. Now, again, I haven't done that much research because I've been busy doing other things, but it is something that I'm planning on looking at. Um, Gwen, did you, or who was, uh, Alex was up next. I didn't know if anybody wanted to come in on social justice and postmodernism. I'm waiting for somebody to I mean, take I, I could, I could okay. say yeah. one or two things that Please. I've just been thinking of. Um, in my experience, first of all, I, I've had, I had a few mentors who were um, feminists when I was an undergrad and they did not necessarily get along with um, with postmodernists, and uh, well, it, part of part of that was that David Foster Wallace actually taught at my university for a time, and so I think there was there was sometimes some bad blood between certain professors, but um, that's not to say that there is an overlap in the methodology between um, people who care about social justice and people who want to understand the world through a postmodern or a meta modernist lens. Um, there is, I think, a degree to which deconstruction is inherent to, to any approach of, of social justice that wants to be critical of the society in which you live. You know, you're, you're trying to understand the things around you and you break them down into smaller parts and you talk about those parts. And that all makes a lot of sense. But um, I guess with regards to the Overton window, it's interesting because the first person I ever heard use the term was Glenn Beck. And I, I was like, what is the I was thinking what I was always thinking when Glenn Beck would talk, which was, what is this guy talking about? But, yeah, uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the part of it that I'm concerned about is, is the window part, because I think if you think about um, politics as being a left to right spectrum and you think about a window, that sort of inherently means that something on the outside is accepted. And then whatever's on the middle is, uh, is, or something on the everything on the outside is not accepted and whatever's on the inside is accepted and as an analysis of, of whatever ideas society is willing to accept at large at the time that's fair but it does sort of capitulate to whatever the center of the window happens to be um, you could very easily imagine that ideas on the far left and the far right could be simultaneously accepted in different parts of society and then you would have like two overton bubbles but the term window does seem to endorse a certain style of thinking. It is to me, it, it implies a narrowing. And, you know, if I were to do a really kind of weird analogy, but think about a snake eating um, rocks of different sizes. I mean, this, this, to me, the spectrum is the spectrum. Now, it might change by based on the center you're in or the political system you're in, in terms of constraining you to a two party system and then that lining up on sort of a left to right spectrum. But this, yeah, this idea of a window, as you say, sort of seems like it takes that and it compresses it, but it stretches out certain parts of it or makes it bigger in some kind of way. And it, it's just really not how when you look at a population and you're measuring attitudes and political identifications and parties that you would vote for, that's, you, you see parties go up and down or you see ideologies become more unpopular. You know, you have generational waves where there's more older people. So people are more conservative. You have a younger wave, like in the 1960s and all my background noise um, and things be, you know, go a bit more left. So you have this over time change as well, but um, yeah, uh, it, it's like I said, it, it was something that I've been scratching my head about uh, over for, for a while. And uh, I've kicked off the conversation. Uh, oh, Alex, you said you had uh, some problems with your device. So uh, have you fixed those? Yeah, I, uh, I, have a, I have a manual mute button on my device that I just reflexively <laughs> turn on whenever I smoke on my vape. Um, and I didn't turn it off. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, postmodernism and social justice or something else that you want yeah, to pick yeah, up yeah. on? Um, so. Uh, 
you know, as far as postmodernism and social justice goes, it's kind of interesting because I do, because I don't know exactly how to put it. It's like a square, it's like a squares and rectangles sort of thing. Like I've never met a postmodernist that wasn't interested in social justice, but I have met many people interested in social justice who are who definitely do not like postmodernism, and that's an interesting thing to me. Um, I th- I think that the rejection of meta narratives, this sort of deconstructionist view of society and the way things are, it's it's a rejection not only of traditionalism. And, and and conserving things, not necessarily conserv- conservatism and as a whole, but uh, can you hear me now? I momentarily disconnected. Um, <laughs> oh God, there's two of me in the room. Um, I don't know how that happened. You've got a doppelganger. You're going to die in a few weeks. Oh, no. Um, (laughs) Slip in our little inside joke. Oh, no. Everything goes wrong technologically wise when I'm involved. Um, Okay, so blah. Postmodernists tend to be interested in in social justice, but many people in social justice are are not very interested in postmodernism. So. The thing for me is that is that because postmodernists are so interested in, in deconstruction and going against meta narratives, there's sort of this necessary thing of them going against um, not only traditionalism uh, and tr- and and social conventions that we take for granted these days, uh, but it sort of it goes against centrism as well. Uh, and I think that when you go against traditionalism and centrism, when you're when you want to go in the opposite direction of these things, it sort of necessarily propels you towards an interest not necessarily in social justice but at the very least something to the left of any of that um politically speaking so i don't necessarily think the postmodernist thought will is in, in is inexorably uh connected to, to interest in social justice matters but i do think that um it's definitely a starting off point that will propel a lot of people to go in that general direction uh, at the very least. And so, and because that's the case, because you won't find a postmodernist who's not at least somewhat leftist, um, the, the, the issue there is that it's very easy to conflate postmodernism and leftist philosophy in general, uh, at least by people who are not either of those things, uh, be it centrists or people who are on the right. Uh, so that's sort of why we see a lot of, uh, well, it's one of the reasons why we see a lot of uh, the conflations that we see with people like Jordan Peterson, who try to say that basically anything that's left, that's left of him is wrong because postmodernism. Um, so uh, I, I think that's kind of the only actual connection that there is, is that the, the fundamentals of rejecting meta narratives will just push you left. Uh, almost inevitably, so it's easy to associate them together that like that. I don't think it's a necessary connection that one causes the other, but they are definitely kissing cousins, I guess. Yeah, I guess I just I just jump off of that real quick because I think that it's um it's funny the conflations that people pull. I've seen like postmodernism and feminism are the same and postmodernism and uh, like anything, like name a thing. But the one that I think is funny is postmodernism and collectivism, because I think that as far as the drift to the left that you see from people who, are, who have a lot of social justice and postmodern sympathies, there is something to that. I think that there's a kind of uh, concept of collective um, narrative that is, is used to kind of break the, the, the meta narrative that um that you find in postmodernism. And hey, I'm back. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. My internet connection Christy's is dropped back. out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I figured you guys were I actually be I wasn't worried you'd be able to handle it because you guys are fabulous and you have such great things to say. But yeah, my um, wireless connection dropped out, so I had to get over and get the lead and run it to my laptop and plug it in and refresh the page. It was a thing. 
Oh, uh, trust me, I know that all too well. I've actually dropped out of a few of my own streams, so I think that's <laughs> what happened because I'm like, well, the stream's still running, and if Christy intentionally dropped out, it would have stopped running on YouTube. Like, it would have just cut short. Yeah, I wouldn't say not say goodbye. Uh, right. So we've been going now for ooh, uh, about an hour and a half, which has been it's been a great talk. But um, maybe be uh, time to wrap it up in the next you know six six to sixteen minutes. Uh, but before I did that, I wanted to just throw out uh, the floor here for anybody who had anything they wanted to talk about that we haven't covered, or um, yeah, ask any questions that are outstanding. So yeah, go ahead. Um, I wasn't sure if Ted wanted to go first. He looked like he wanted to go first. <laughs> you go. Okay, thank you. Um, so there was actually a question in the uh, in in the chat and a follow up statement. Uh, I, I mean, kind of looking at both of them. Uh, somebody asked what postmodernism would look like in the future, and then somebody else said, "Well, I don't think I, I, from what I understand, postmodernism is for the most part dead, so I'm not sure it has a future." Um, <laughs> but I don't <laughs> I don't think it's dead. I just think it's being taken uh, like paradoxically speaking, postmodernism is a rejection of, of of conventional ways in which to do thought and art and trying to create something new, a new way to tell a story, a new way to examine a philosophical concept. And, and so whether or not there are philosophers who promote postmodern thinking, there's still going to be this postmodern. Hi. <laughs> You joined us at the butt end. Hello, Bronx blogger. You joined us right uh, at the end. <laughs> oh my god! Let, let me get my uh, let me get my microphone. All right, we're going to put you on mute till then. Okay. Sure. Thank you. All right. Um. So. Uh, like what I was saying was basically that it, it, postmodernism, as it is used in philosophy, as it is used in art, as it is used in fiction and storytelling in general, in, in movies and shows and what have you, it's not going to go away. It's uh, whether or not there are people who are advocating for it, it doesn't really matter. There's still going to be people who want to do something new, who want to, who learn about the medium with, in which they want to interact with and then want to do something different with that medium. Whether or not that's actually expanded upon as to why with postmodernist philosophers in any way is going to be kind of irrelevant. What I can say about the future of postmodernism, whatever it is, it's definitely not going to be anything that we have seen thus far because that is the fundamental nature of it. Right. Very well said. <laughs> I don't really know if I could top that, so I'm not even going to try. Um, Ted, I think you um, were going to speak next, and then, yeah. Oh, no, it might go around in the big circle that society could be so postmodern that the most postmodern thing to do is stick to the norms. <laughs> right. That's when conservatism becomes the new punk rock. Hopefully not. But who knows? One day, Pooh Joseph Watson might be right once. But the one serious thing I thought of thinking politically is I I know that sustainingly obvious really but the left always has a bit of a change and the one does a bit of a item of a stick into traditions. So it's in the white nature that they hate postmodernism because it's about change and they don't do change. Well, while you were uh, speaking, we were joined by um, another guest. <laughs> so, hello. Hello, Tim. How oh, God. You? I don't know if uh, Bronx Bogger is. Mike is good to go. 
I thought it was going to start in half an hour, to be honest. I know you keep saying check the link, but I had just in my mind (laughs) said that it was at at 11. uh, Well, that's that's, that's the problem with your perspective. You have a limited perspective on reality. So, yeah. I have a postmodern perspective on time. My time. 11 p.m., my time. (laughs) I was like, we're going by POMO time, right? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Well, we're, we're coming near the end of the yes, hangout, so yeah, now we can just start it all over. Yes, we're going to modern time. <laughs> With objective time. <laughs> <laughs>